to discuss laws, in particular as they touch on trials, awards, and procedure. In a previous hour, we looked in on some of the provisions of the Common Sense Legal Reforms Act, as, as it is called, uh, 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 which is a part of the Contract with America provision that deals with tort reform. We'll touch on others with Mr. Alan Dershowitz, a renowned criminal lawyer and professor at the Harvard Law School, Peter Huber, the author, mechanical engineer, and, and uh, a lawyer, Pamela Gilbert, uh, consumer lobbyist and, and lawyer, Edwin Weisel, lawyer and public official, Thomas Moore, renowned attorney and trial lawyer, and Stephen Begalis, an authority on malpractice and trial law. Ms. Gilbert, could we hear from you on what goes under the title Honesty in Evidence? What are they talking about? Yes, this is a part of the, um, the uh, contract on America, as we like to call it, that's, um, that Congress is looking at right now that would restrict the kind of evidence and the kind of expert witnesses that could, can be brought into court. What's interesting is that as originally introduced, the restriction would have applied to both um, civil and criminal cases. And prosecutors from around the country um, started calling up to Congress and saying, you cannot do this to us. And in fact, they invoked the O.J. Simpson trial and said, for example, the prosecutors would probably have a very hard time getting the DNA evidence that they want to bring into court, into court, if this provision were the law. So they have now since changed the provision so it only applies to civil lawsuits. Now, of course, that uh, plaintiffs and people who are injured by uh, dangerous products or by pollution don't have the kind of clout that prosecutors around the country do so that we weren't able to contact the Congress and say, well, wait a minute, if you don't want to restrict evidence in a prosecution, why all of a sudden is it okay to restrict evidence in my case? Why is it? Well, to start with, I'm surprised to hear that the federal rules of evidence apply in the O.J. Simpson trial. I thought it was in state court, but, I, but I, I'd be all for, uh, I think we should control junk science in court uh, in any kind of trial. It's a, it, I think it's an abomination that we have psychiatrists testifying in capital cases about the future dangerousness of, of uh, defendants. I mean, I, I can predict future dangerousness, but it offends me that somebody dresses up in a white coat and says they made a science of it. Well, of course, so it, you would, it, it you offends would, the process of justice. Yeah, that so you would then be in favor of amending it and yeah. saying Violence. that whatever applies Violence. in civil cases Symmetric. applies sure. in criminal I'm cases sure. and that it's a disgrace to put people dressed up as scientists who in fact are, are testifying on the basis of the scientific equivalent of entrails and horoscopes and then really just groundless stuff and pretend yeah. they're experts and yeah. so would I and so would I because we know, we know of people doing 20 years for child abuse that some <laughs> therapist alleging recovered memories which is an almost entirely discredited theory, has been allowed to present in a prosecution case. 20 years. Look at that woman who was just let out after five years of sitting in a cell when she was about as guilty of what they said as we at the panel were. Well, this junk science is also junk common sense, and that is you hear still to this day a lawyers arguing, you saw that defendant sweat. That must mean that he's guilty. You saw him twitch nervously. There's a lot of junk in the I, courts, but Alan, and I think we can agree but the, but to there's try a to big get difference. that no, junk no, out of the there's court. There's a big difference, and I'll tell you what the big difference is. When you dress somebody up with a mantle of authority, they walk in, and in effect, they're coming in saying, look, I have the... The, the dignity, the reliability, the verifiability of science on my shoulders, that is a, an outright fraud. The, the rest is people get things Would wrong. They say, yeah, me, look Peter, like that there's, there's, there's a difference, say, in a criminal case between evidence that should be enough to raise a reasonable doubt and evidence that should be enough to overcome a reasonable I, I, doubt. Take, for example, DNA. Surely it is advanced scientifically enough so that if you find a mismatch between the DNA of a defendant left at the scene of the crime and the DNA of that defendant, it should be enough to raise a reasonable doubt no. and acquit him, but no. you might not no, Alan, have it one, enough to never. overcome reasonable no. doubt. Why not? I'm dead sure of, and that is science doesn't care who wins or loses in trials. I mean, science is, a, is objective. But the law cares. Alan, and it's a genius. You've managed to turn this program into a bill of the hour. <laughs> this is quite wonderful no, I quite on the, on the uh, quite DNA matter. In this case. That the real thing about junk science is, as Peter says, it's not only that the expert wears his white coat, but the rules of evidence give him a very special status. A witness is only able to testify as to what he or she saw or heard with actually with his senses. The expert's permitted to give a conclusion. That carries great weight. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when an expert gives testimony, and says, in my opinion, the defendant was negligent, almost routinely the matter goes to the jury. The judge has lost his screening function, which was historically important, and which exists in the very kind of cases of the sweaty witness testimony 
But I'd like to put back, and we'd like to put back with the expert no. witness, the junk, phony expert witnesses. But they're the staple of many tort cases today, without a doubt. I, I but would... the whole concept that we're talking about is the antithesis of the civil trial. It's interesting, and Peter disowned it, but nonetheless, Congress backed off in the criminal trial, but they're insisting on going ahead in the civil trial. The interesting thing is, there's a greater burden of proof in a criminal case than a civil case. So they'll stop... They'll, they won't, they don't want it in, in the criminal case, or at least they'll agree to forego it because of the outcry by the prosecutors throughout mm -hmm. the land, where there it has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But where the test is a preponderance of evidence, which basically means weighing it, and whichever side comes out is more likely indicating the truth, th there it applies. So in other words, you throw in an ap a practically absolute standard and, and, and throw at a plaintiff when he's trying to prove a case through scientific evidence that there's somebody up there other than the jury who's going to rule ahead of time whether the jury can hear the testimony and whether it's quote unquote junk science based on a standard that's the antithesis of the civil jury of the civil trial system. Oh, no, it's the expert yeah. witness. The expert witness is, is the exception, okay? Ordinary witnesses testify about this. When we let an expert witness into court, we give him or her tremendous license, okay? And so the exception starts when you let the expert witness in. And the question is just how free should we be? Well, we know it's an exception, but it's an unwarranted exception. And, 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 and you exception. want to make it a completely open no, no, exception we, and we, let that's anybody that's call them. We ought to know who... No, that's not, that's not what I'm advocating, and you know I'm, that's not what I'm advocating, no, but I don't exactly want... Like what you're I don't want the big person standing back and making these judgments unwarrantedly when it's a jury trial. All, we ought to know who we're going to hurt. We ought to know who we're going to hurt. We ought to know who we're going to hurt here too, and that is uh, this is a new this is a fact. Uh, if we exclude junk science, we will also exclude developing science, science that is not yet completed. Not at all. And let me give you an example of it. And and here I have mixed feelings. Uh, what I call feminist science today. Uh, science that is evolving as we increase feminist sensitivities toward the law. Battered women syndrome today could not pass uh, a double-blind scientific uh, test. Uh, a lot of uh, stuff that gets into a rape trauma syndrome in cases. I recently had a case, uh, a sexual harassment case, where a woman who was an expert, but uh, she admitted she was an advocate for women, she said, in my expertise, women who claim that they were sexually harassed don't lie. And that piece of expertise was allowed to go before the fact finder. As conclusive? Uh, as con no, as, not as conclusive, but that was her view, that women who claim sexual harassment don't lie. There was a conference at Columbia recently entitled, Women Tell the Truth. Well, some do and some don't. Some people who claim sexual harassment lie, some don't. Some who claim they were raped lie, some don't. Some children who will claim they were abused lie, and some don't. We are, however, I, and I agree with, with imposing science on this, but I wouldn't hold it rigidly because I think we are seeing some areas that are developing and I don't want to cut the development off without giving it an opportunity to achieve a certain well, state. Well, a judge is capable. Nobody's oh. cutting off the development of science, okay? These scientists are utterly free to go off and do what they call science anywhere they like. The question is whether on either side of the courtroom, for defense or for plaintiffs, they should be wheeled in to have what is often decisive, dispositive influence on those trials. And I don't see why, I mean, you're, you have as much risk of having junk science favor one side as the other, okay? There, there's a symmetry here. Why? Uh, you, you, you pick some sympathetic cases of battered women, although I would have thought that I could wheel out some battered woman science that would, would work very badly in a criminal case of somebody accused of murdering their wife. Well, as we have. But his, his point, is that, it, his, his point uh, is that exonerative uh, 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 fake expertise uh, should weigh more heavily than culpable expertise. Well, he, no, in, in criminal cases, in, yeah. in civil cases, I think the general point is that, yeah, that the, the other way around. We, if it we have, rates, so you, we have all, you shouldn't let it Okay, we well, let, let's move on to attorney accountability, which is another separate uh, section of this um, mm -hmm. Legal Reforms Act. What do you have to say about that, Mr. Well, Howard? It really gets to, in its current form, it's rather weak, although in the version that will be introduced by Senators Abraham and McConnell, and that it will probably be on the House floor, it's going to be a lot tougher. And it relates to a reform that's been supported spectacularly by such people as Robert Bork on the one hand, and uh, Erwin Griswold, mm -hmm. Norman Dorson, the president of the American Civil Liberties Union, never agreed with Bob Bork on anything other than curbing lawyers' fees in contingency fee cases where they haven't earned the fees. And without getting into the technicalities, what we're talking about is an early offer situation where the defendant is encouraged to put some money on the table to settle the cases quickly, and if the defendant earns that right, 
to reduce his costs by settling a case on his everybody own. on his own everybody wins except the lawyers what we now have is a situation where legal fees consume in the easy cases and the hard cases 60 percent of the cost of cases and a system which gives defendants incentives to keep cases going forever you yeah. want to reverse those i'm going to say the, the fact is that defendants are not taking the incentives that they have over the years to settle cases they earlier. don't exist and, and the, this 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 has a genesis going back a few years bill and the basic concept is that they saw insurance companies and those trying to settle claims saw that the public was kind of askance at the way they rushed to get to somebody before a lawyer so now what they're so interested in doing is interfering with I'm talking about those the claims people and those that are interested in, in uh, the people saving who are in favor money of for injuries that they cause people or that they're responsible for paying for those injuries. Mike, how about a modified version of it where you give an incentive to the person to settle, but only after conferring with a lawyer, getting fully advised of the lawyer's rights, the lawyer gets a significant but not overwhelming proportion of it. You want some a sliding, a sliding scale. It, huh? Alan, sliding scale. We can quibble on some of the not details. That's very no, important. no, no, no. The notion of having to consult with a lawyer and building in real legal fees mm -hmm. for claimants so that they can assess the value of the offer is inherent in any fair proposal. But what we're saying is, if the defendant puts enough money on the table that after consulting a lawyer, the claimant and his lawyer see that there's not enough left in the case to go forward, that's the setting uh, in which we ought to reduce legal fees. We ought to create a self-enforcing mechanism which defines the point where the parties agree and the point where the parties disagree. I think we have something to talk about. You bet. I think we have something to talk about, but I think it's only to talk about. Well, maybe Ellen wants to talk about it, but the fact is that any, first of all, the contingent fee system is uh, assailed because of the fact that it allows people who can't afford a lawyer otherwise to get to the court, to get to bring claims and eventually bring lawsuits. Now, corporate America and the insurance industry has been continuously and unrelentingly interfering in this area. It's interesting that at the same time that they're continuing this interference, there are people in corporate America that are saying, we're getting a little tired of paying bills uh, by billable hour system, and we'd like a result-oriented system. Zoe Baird, the general counsel for, for the Aetna Insurance Company, Aetna Life and Casualty, recently said that uh, the concept of fixed fees, of capping fees, and the idea of a result-oriented fee system rather than this billable hour system in the corporate world is a good idea. Now, isn't it interesting that as the corporate world, at least as somebody as, uh, as uh, outstanding as uh, Ms. Baird, is interested in maybe moving towards something that sounds strangely like contingent fee, the, the corporate America, on the other hand, is, in, is interested in doing away with or interfering no. with it on the level, on, no, except as no, you, wait, 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 no, wait, you're a great man, to interfere, I, I no, this, this to interfere let, let with it. the lawyer and the client and to somehow yeah. hit them against okay. one another. Yeah. You've been trying to do it for years, I, 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 and this is your last heinous oh, effort. I want it. you to opine on a half those situation. Heinous effort. Let me wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. That's right, heinous. A woman is mutilated or run over or whatever. And uh, mm -hmm. the, she's approached by the insurance company and says, uh, will mm -hmm. you accept a million dollars? Right. So she says to herself, well, that's, uh, that sounds like a good piece of change. But wait a minute, I'm going to call my lawyer. Absolutely. So the lawyer comes. The lawyer says, no, you ought, to, you ought to ask for a million and a half. Mm -hmm. And he gets it. Question, mm -hmm. should his fees be based on the half million uh, uh, incremental increase or on the million and a half? That's, the, that's of course, the issue. Yeah. Uh, it should be on it's not the, the value that the lawyer produced. So is increment. that what this provision example, is all about? Precise, but and it works in other areas not of law. Not precisely at all. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, I may be heinous, but I ought to be able <laughs> I to... I didn't say you were heinous. Okay. I say okay. what you so proposed. Let me, let me say, say you, big difference. Let, let me say what... Uh, uh, let, me, let me say first that in many cases, in many other areas of law, like a condemnation case, if you came to me and said the state was about to build a highway through my house, and I said, sure, I'll represent house? you, Bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll represent you if you give me a third of the recovery. I'd be disbarred because I'd only be able to charge on the difference between what the state offers and what I obtain. It's called value-added billing, which doesn't exist in most cases. And let me tell you what we're really trying to do. We're not creating this. This comes out of the resolution of the American Trial Lawyers Association, your plaintiff's organization. Here's what it says. It says lawyers should use a percentage of the contingent fee contract 
that is commensurate with the risk, cost, and effort required, and discuss with their clients alternate non-contingent fee arrangements. Now, here's the kicker. They recommend it. But in the real world, there's a toll that lawyers extract that is almost never less than 33 to 40 percent of every case. Well, That's not obscene, true. the idea of, the, of having the lawyer... But let, let's come I'll, to a resolution. We can come to a compromise. My, you're asking for too much. Let's assume uh, the, the case that he gives. Um, you can get a million dollars. And the lawyer honestly thinks a million isn't enough. Good. Now, when the lawyer goes to the lawsuit, he put that million at risk also. Not, he doesn't have, it's not as if, if he loses, he gets the million, and if he wins, he gets the million and a half. So you giving him the contingency just on the half a million doesn't quite do it. What I but think he's not going to pay the million I if he loses. What should well, happen is, he didn't earn the million for anybody. It was yes, there he before did. he arrived. Yes, he did, because he gave good advice, and the advice was, you ought to ask for more, and he good put point. that million at risk. So I'm prepared well, to come Alan, to he ought to get an which hourly says, fee just like anyone says, else. Does there. Ten percent, say, on the million that was offered that was put at risk, 25 percent or 30 percent on what most lawyers would say he might have gotten, and say 50 percent on incredible results that no other lawyer could have achieved. Supposing he doesn't Let's get... come to some... Alan, I am but wait a minute. Alan, that Alan, we're Alan, Alan, about. Alan, I ask you this. I am a heart attack in time. proposing mm -hmm. this, and I really want to worry about Pam just a little bit, but I'll tell you this. We can work out some numbers here in due course. The only thing I'm concerned about is I want a simpler self-executing system. Yeah. And I don't want lots of trials over speculation about what the risk is. Why would we want but, the but federal government sort of doing it in the first place? Somebody's arrangement Here's why, with Pam. their own lawyer. Here's do we why. do that with doctors? Do we do that with corporate CEOs? Do we do it with the corporation? Well, lawyers, are we doing it with our Pam, own power? Why don't you let them answer? I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer. I'll give you the answer. I'll give you the answer to it. That percentage, this isn't I'll right. give you the answer. To it. It. Well, give it, give it, All give right. it. Well, it's, it's, it's hard, yeah. it's hard. Um, there is a thing called the fiduciary obligation and the model rules of legal conduct. And the model rules say that a lawyer is only permitted to charge a, quote, reasonable fee. That is, it is inherent in our relationship with clients where we tend to have a monopoly of the information Corporate that we're subject to. Alan, right? Alan, oh, wait, wait, wait. please. We're talking about a tort lawyer dealing with an accident victim, a first-time person in the legal process. And we're not talking about any equivalence of competence or information. In any event, if you want to repeal the canons of ethics, why go ahead and have what you call the so-called market standard. It's simply inconsistent with our fiduciary obligation to clients. And all I'm saying is, if we have fiduciary obligations, let's enforce them and take them seriously. And we've no hypocritical talk and not enforce them. say what they say, but they say the federal government, with people like you say, should stay off people's backs, is now snooping around lawyers and clients to see what one is charging the other. Now, let's, the states have been doing a pretty good job for a long time. Well, let's well, continue to leave them do it. That's why the state justices have said that this kind of bills that are being proposed by people like this in Congress are so onerous. Is that because right? Be, they, have no, they have no bearing on what the federal system should be doing. Congress should mind their own business well, in this area. Let me just, now, people, well, people at state level are very interested in what's happening with contingent fees. And people are in, in, in the... Uh, in the Plaintiff's bar and the defendant's bar have been talking about this. This the issue should be decided on the basis of and what... people are not getting away with what you say they're getting away with, and there's no need for the federal let government to their noses in. They have a lot of mo let more let important the issues to be decided on the basis of what's uh, best for the but, 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 average got, person, not what's best for the Alan, lawyer or what's best you for the bet. That's my standard, but I want to add, let's talk about the average person. 70% of the American people think lawyers are less honest than most people. And that's not just historic lawyer bashing. That's a doubling in negative sentiments over the last five years. Over 50% of the American public, contest. excuse me, Alan, excuse me, you're the guy who talks about the common man. That's right. And, and the common man is, them to Alan, the common man is speaking, and the common man has good sense. And most Americans know that the system which purports to protect them is often, not always, but often rigged in favor of the guys who sit at the courthouse door. We've got to reform our own house, not only if, to save consumers, but for the sake of the rule of law itself. You tell... But it's, corporate America is not going to save Oh, Alan, it isn't corporate consumer. Are you Please assuming me. that these no. people are manipulated by corporate America, these dumb American voters who overwhelmingly are demanding massive radical legal reform but they, they are responsible they, they know also they don't want the federal government reform. doing this and arizona yeah, and on. michigan that sense very conservative I, 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 voted against this kind mm -hmm. of thing 
Well, gentlemen, let's, let's uh, move I on think, to the prior well, I want to uh, take substantial exception to something, Alan, just said that corporate America right. couldn't care less about the consumer and what have you. First of all... That, is that news? Product that... liability <laughs> imposed upon American corporations is, making, is costing them so much, and these are actual statistics, that they are no longer competitive with, with foreign corporations that aren't loaded with these costs. Who pays for this? We who have to buy the Americans' products and the workers that get laid off. Now, of course, the corporations are out for a profit. That's what they're there for. I hope they're there for. Otherwise, I don't, I don't like socialist systems. But the Except point is... For lawyers. You would like to impose a little bit of socialism on lawyers, on, right? Uh, on Wall Street firms, too. The whole thing's out of control. Well, I don't that's think that's there's a lawyer alive point. that's worth $500 an hour. I certainly... Now yeah. you're hitting the home. Yeah, I know. Well, I used to get that. I thought it was ridiculous. How about 25000 bucks an hour, which is not uncommon in the asbestos cases, where the lawyers are getting 40% of the recovery, where everybody knows pretty much what the recovery is going to be when the client walks in the door. How do we defend that, Alan? You We've got to stop it. You bet that. you can. Well, let's move on to prior notice. Uh, what do we mean by prior notice, uh, Ms. Gilbert? Uh, I think this is uh, another one of uh, Michael's provisions that's going to go very quickly in the, in the legislation. But the uh, prior notice provision requires um, a plaintiff, before they file a lawsuit, to notify the defendant and give them, I think it's 30 days, to, um, to respond with some kind of offer before they would file their lawsuit. But part of that provision required that the defendant give information to the plaintiff about what the defendant knows about the, uh, the dangers or potential dangers in their product. The defendants are very, very opposed to that provision because they don't want to be giving anybody any information that they don't have to, and particularly prior to a lawsuit. So I do believe that the prior notice provision is going to be uh, gone quickly because corporations don't like it. The point of information, at what point do they have to give this information? Be prior to filing of a lawsuit. This is just notification. I'm going to sue you because I was injured by your automobile that I claim has a defect. And what in. kind of information are the defendants under this proposed uh, law required to give to the plaintiff? The information proposed? about the design. But isn't that true in discovery product. normally? It sounds like yes, a but that's a time. That's but after a after a lawsuit is filed and then discovery begins. This is prior to a lawsuit prior to any court overseeing it. And I don't I don't blame what defendants you, for being uncomfortable and being even, in this nether nether land of before the lawsuit. Sue every company in America just hand out summonses and, and just so you can get their dis, their material. Uh, I'm not proposing this provision. Them later <laughs> was, uh, this is a Newt Gingrich provision. This is like him. the um, plaintiffs bars pothole patrol that goes around New York say here's a pothole if anybody steps in this oh, consumer, or, uh... <laughs> uh, well what about the legislative checklist we've only got about two minutes who who feels uh, hot under the collar about a legislative checklist what's the legislative talking checklist talking uh, about a safe harbor for... no this is a, well, this a... is this is a um, enlightenment bill yeah this is the title of that particular provision um, it requires, before legislation is passed by the U.S. Congress, for it to be very clear about whether it has retroactive application, whether it's going to cost the judicial system more money, whether it creates private rights of action. What I think is, is interesting is that the, an analysis like that should be done to this legislation, and it would fall. It would I, just sink under its own that weight. That is true, Pam, but I have to say, it is true that the analysis should be done to this, and I don't think it would fall. But rather, I'd like to see lawyer impact statements in every bit of legislation, which is what we're talking about, that are the equivalent of uh, environmental impact statements. We pass some statute, Congress goes home, thinks it's done good. Often, Congress has passed a vaguely worded statute that's just an annuity the for lawyers on all sides. Right. I have no yeah. problem with that. Awful. And we ought to have reform. But I think one that. thing is clear. Every piece of legislation should have a title that at least we understand. I mean, here we have <laughs> bills. I don't even know what <laughs> they mean. I take, I, make them I, I take it you favor this kind of an approach. Alan, do you get impeached you know, I, for saying that in Washington? <laughs> it's a, a cost-benefit analysis just like Ford did. Uh, it seems to be a good Common thing. Common sense approach to talk. Well, well, there seems to be some ambiguity about it. We have one minute to discuss securities uh, strike uh, lawsuits. Uh, uh, what we're talking about class actions. Gun to the head lawsuits where lawyers don't have any real clients. They hunt up a phony shareholder and uh, they can make a company bet itself on the lawsuit so companies have got to settle. And you're not talking about the Fortune 500. You're talking, the real victims of these cases are the new startup companies, the high tech companies. They're the ones complaining and they desperately need relief from the blackmail lawsuits that are there because the damages, if the lawyer wins, are so great. And we're going to have substantial reform there. On that one, Democrats have joined Republicans. I think, but not consumers haven't joined. And the expenses, if you even if you win. 
The expenses are horrendous even if you win your lawsuit as a defendant. Well, what would be a classic example of uh, opportunism of the kind we don't here's, welcome? Here's what happens. Uh, the share of a stock goes down five points. In come these guys with lawsuits. They're just ground out kind of lawsuits. They've got, they go into depositions. There may be a 10% chance or a 3% chance of winning or losing the case, but the costs of the case are going to be high, and the risk of letting that case go to a jury and getting the wrong kind of judge is so high. It also has it an seems impact cheap on to sell it for ten million dollars. If you're here on your side, it also has an impact on corporate managers to design them to go to risk-free to, to look at the yeah. effect of the stock rather than on the effect on the product. Mm -hmm. And uh, th right. these lawsuits stink. Now, we have to figure out how not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, because there are some good derivative lawsuits. The ones you've how described, about, I agree, completely agree. How about Thank loser you, Professor Thank you, Mr. Wessel. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Pagelis. I neglected you. Thank no you problem. anyway. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Next week on Firing Line, host William F. Buckley, Jr. is joined by the ACLU's Ira Glasser, Georgetown University law professor David Cole, the Arab American Institute's James Zogby, journalist Stephen Emerson, attorney Victoria Tunsing, and writer Michael Kinsley for the first of a two-part program on the new anti-terror bill. This program was a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated. Additional support was provided by the Eisberg Foundation and the Friends of Firing Line. For information.